Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. It was a muggy April in 1974. I was a freshly minted detective on my first case. Still incredibly green behind the ears. My partners, Dan and Tom, were with me. They had a few more miles than myself. (laughs) Miles behind a desk, that is. Dude, what does that even mean? I think he's making fun of us. Ugh! These two Neanderthals couldn't pour piss out of a boot even if the instructions were written on the hill. I alone was their saving grace. Dude! The hell? We can hear you! Hey, you guys know I have nothing but respect for you. I have no respect for these losers. We arrived at the crime scene. It was as big a mess as my partner's careers. Sir, you can't smoke in here. This is a preschool. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so, sorry. Sorry. Why are you even here? Aren't these other officers in charge? Whoa. Detective policemen and McLean. I'm like Patrolman Chet the Wave Walker, bro. Yeah, and I'm his partner, Patrolman Randy Wheelhouse Spielman. Dude, we've heard so much about you from this whole exchange program with our bros down in uh, California. They used to work here. They said they worked with you a while back, and you were totally awesome to work with. Yeah, can't wait to work for you. So what have you found? (sighs) Well, looking at the clues here at this scene, whoever stole what we're looking for might have been the ones who- Whoa, dude, dude, gotta stop you for just a second. We're not after anyone for, like, stealing anything, bro. We're, like, after some terrorists, like, seriously. Like, some movie shit-level terrorists. What? What? Yeah, we got a hot tip that some terrorists are on a rampage, and they made their way here. Whoa. Okay, so, I'm just spitballing here, but there is a chance, given the evidence that we have found here, that uh, whoever stole from the fire pit are the same terrorists that you guys are hunting down. They might even be using what they stole from us, uh, the fire pit, what they stole from the fire pit to further their nefarious plot, right, bro? But anyway, so if we catch them, we're probably going to catch your terrorist. Whoa, for real. It was total bullshit, but I said this to get them off our back. I knew we could find our guy. And if they were lucky, we might find their guy too. Uh, yo, detective policeman, is your brother like, all right? Yeah, don't pay attention to my fr- my brother. He's been that way since he got back from Nam. Detectives, I think I found something. Whoa, is that? Yep. Apple juice. And this trick of trail leads us to where 512 ounces should be. What sick bastards. They're stealing apple juice from kids? It's probably the same type of people who blow up a prison. What? Uh, Oh yeah, dude. It's these terrorists we're after. These gnarly bros have been impersonating cops for like weeks now. Like beating up on civilians and contaminating crime scenes. It's totally gnarly. Dude, they like totally burned down an Antarctic research lab. Like burned the whole thing down. I know, right? Then they would like get arrested, right? And then they bust in, break out of this prison with a helicopter, blow the whole freaking place up. It was awesome. And then they crashed the helicopter to cover their tracks, man. It was awesome. No, we didn't cr- I mean, yeah, they totally did that on purpose too. Not at all by accident, crashing that helicopter. Oh yeah, for sure, bro. Totally calculated. But anywho, we just like heard from like reports and shit that they're on their way back to the Big Apple. So now it's time to do some real for real police work. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. Like really get righteous with some detective work and like, hey detectives, why are you slowly backing away like you're trying to sneak away from us? <coughs> oh yeah, we just uh, need to check out the we're this just, about uh, we're gonna um, go to Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Gentlemen, we are on an adventure. First, we're going to flood the city with blue, with Chadwick Boseman and 21 Bridges. Then it's going to get chilly with Keith Davey and The Thing. But then after that, we buddy up with Kurt Russell. Welcome to America! And Tango and Cash. Here's where it gets different. When we take Sylvester Stallone and Nighthawks, and then when we try to figure out who's who. So please pay attention. With Rutger Howard and Blade Runner. And then put on your hats as we take Harrison Ford to Raiders of the Lost Ark. Hike up those boots and crack those whips because the fire pit is swinging into adventure. Follow Dan, Tom, and Josh as they race the skies and follow the dotted lines to the X that marks the spot of this journey. 
Indiana Jones, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's danger. It's deception. But hopefully there won't be any snakes. Every Tuesday, here at the Fire Pit. Gentlemen, I hope we live to tell the tale. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Colorado Josh, and we have a thrilling episode in store for you tonight. We hope. We got back from the frigid Antarctic tundra, just in time to escape from prison, clear our names-ish. So now we're back to the Big Apple, tracking down terrorists and checking out Rocky with a beard. But as per our rules, we've taken an actor or an actress from our last film and moved them on over to this one. But to tell us a little bit more about what we're watching and who we're watching, I'm going to go ahead and pass the line over to Dan. Thank you, Josh. Good day, everyone. I'm Massachusetts Dan, and last week we watched Kurt Russell go from ice and snow to palm trees and cocaine with Sylvester Stallone in 1989's Tango and Cash, a buddy cop film that was full of gunfights, shootouts, and one-liners in that classic buddy cop fashion. Tonight, we follow Stallone to a much earlier point in his career in a much different kind of cop film with 1981's Nighthawks, one of Stallone's first post-Rocky films. To give us a bit of a rundown, though, on the film we're watching and maybe a look into what we can expect out of tonight's movie, I'll put the APB out on Tom. This is Tom. This is Tom coming in. Thank you, Dan. California Tom here. And as mentioned, tonight we're watching 1981's Nighthawks. Starring Sylvester Stallone, Billy D. Williams, Rutger Howard, and Persis Kambada. I actually got that last name right the first time. Holy we God. <laughs> oh, did. good on me. I'm going to screw it up every other time I say it. But Nighthawks was released on April 10, 1981. So the film just had its 40th birthday. Congratulations. Its running time is 99 minutes which is much longer than most people who are 40 years old or over. It had a budget of $5 million, although that number is unconfirmed, and a box office of $19.9 million. IMDb score sits at a pretty standard 6.4, with a Rotten Tomato score of 70%, but an audience score of 55%. So still barely fresh, but pretty big sort of um, divide between critic and watcher. But how about I get a little more meta than that? So not too meta. Josh, start the clock. Starting. (laughs) Nighthawks. Tagline. One man can bring the world to its knees and only one man can stop him. Summary. Deke Da Silva, Sylvester Stallone, and Matthew Fox Billy D. Williams are two New York City cops who get transferred to an elite anti-terrorism squad, not G.I. Joe. Around the same time, infamous international terrorist Haymar Wolfgar Reinhardt, played by Rutger Hauer, shows up in New York City looking to cause some chaos. It's up to Da Silva and Fox to stop him, but will they be in time? We got a prototype terrorists take Manhattan thriller that would eventually set the template for future 1990s films of the same milk. Competently put together by smart producers with a writer to cast who, unlike past films, fit the genre they're supposed to be working for. But maybe they could have taken another pass at the director. Behind the camera, we have producers Herb Nanas, an associate with Martin Pohl, an odd combination Herb would eventually go on to do some Stallone stuff, including Rambo, First Blood, and Rocky III. Uh, Martin was a hard drama sort of guy, and with historical pieces. Uh, Lion and Winter, The Magic Garden, the interesting stuff between the two of them. This was written, though, by David Schaber, who came up with the uh, story with uh, Paul Silbert, who's known for suspense and action thrillers. The Hunt for Red October which was uncredited, and Flight of the Intruder, but previous films before this, he did The Warriors. So this guy knows how to write a film. But this is another case of multiple directors, guys. Dan might have some more about the what's and the why's, but this film started with Gary Nelson, but would eventually go on to be directed by Bruce Malmuth, whose genres include none. 
because the only things he was known for were ABC after school specials. That was it. The biggest hits he's had since then was a Steve Gutenberg film called The Man Who Wasn't There and Steven Seagal's Hard to Kill. Tangent real quick. Where the hell did he get these people from? Considering the last movie we had, uh, the official director's only claim was a shitty horror film. Honestly, well, okay, I, okay, I'm stepping back. I'll save some more for final thoughts. But thank God we have our protagonists in front of the camera. Sylvester Stallone, Billy D. Williams, and Rutger Hauer. Sylvester Stallone plays Deke Silva. Dramatic actor around this time frame. Early Stallone, the only roles he had before this were the Rocky films. Fist, which was an anti-union movie, and Paradise Alley. So as Nigel's noted, he was trying very hard to be drama actor, but this would be just before he was like, dude, okay, they only want me to blow shit up and punch people. That's what I'm going to do. He would go on to Rocky Three after this and Rambo First Blood. So today I learned he made First Blood after he made Rocky Three which I always thought came before. But along with him is Billy D. Williams, who plays Matthew Fox. Another performance actor, dramas and comedies. We know him for Empire Strikes Back, but he's been in films such as Bingo Long, Traveling All-Stars, Mahogany, and Brian Song, a very dramatic actor at this point in his career. And as the villain Wolfgar was Rutger Howard. And this is his first role. Um, in North America. In North America, thank you for the distinction. Everything else was all Swedish from here, or before this. He plays mostly villains. Um, the second film he did after this was Blade Runner. Other films he's done, Sin City, Blind Fury, Surviving the Game, and a whole bunch of other clunkers. Almost all villains. He doesn't have a good track record of films. But in terms of accolades, this one's not the best received. The... Uh, the critics at the time match more what the audience score is nowadays. I mean, there were some decent ones. Variety called the film an exciting cops and killers yarn. While Jay Scott wrote, this film has a dirty job to do, and it does it. That is not an endorsement. Thumbscrews and cattle prods are also real good at what they do, too. There are no nominations, no recriminations. And that's the meta on this film. Maybe, Josh, it did better than we, the critics, gave it credit for. What's the box office like for when this was released? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> Moving on to Dan. Uh, as we uh, know, and like I've said this multiple times, but just for our new listeners who haven't been with us since we've done a pre-1983 movie, the box office pre-1983, especially in the 70s um, when the summer box office started its major growth period, check out our Jaws episode. We go into a little bit more detail on that one. That was actually our second destination film. Yeah, we talk a lot about the reason why box office reporting was so terrible in the late 70s, early 80s, and it was a lack of computers, lack of basically reporting numbers, especially in the early 80s. Like if you actually look up the numbers, and I checked a few different websites, I couldn't find a lot of information for this particular weekend. There's literally three movies listed. And that was the first, second, and third movies that was released on the weekend of April 10th, 1981. Premiering at number one, do you guys care to take a whack? There's literally three movies on this list. 1981. April 1981. I'll give you a hint. We have talked about it in the past, and one of us had it on a list in this most recent selection section. Um, April 1981. Oh, God. Um, Nigel, I'm going to pass the buck to you. Oh, 1981, 1981. You said we had it on a list for this journey? 1981. It was 1981. on a list. But one yes. we didn't pick. Yeah, not on this destination. Oh, 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 I know this. I know this. I know this. Uh, 1981. Um, It's Excalibur. It was Excalibur. Ah! Oh, oh Nigel. That's like three or four weeks in a row you guys have gotten this. Oh, my God. But yeah, so premiering at number one that weekend was Excalibur grossing $4.5 million. At number two was Nighthawks grossing $2.5 million. And at number three, the ever popular, you won't believe that this movie was released on this weekend. This is Elvis making $429,000. Wait, wasn't that also um, Kurt Russell? Wasn't he in that one? I have no idea. I've never heard of this movie until I read this list. <laughs> okay. And yet it went number three on the box office. Wow. 1981. Not a lot going on. 
Well, 1981, uh, overall, I'm going to go and look at the total highest grossing films in 1981, just to pad my section a little bit. But Nighthawks, for 1981, was the 21st highest grossing film of that year. 21, 21 Bridges. Did you guys see the correlation we got here? Oh, whoa. Whoa. For real, dude. Um, It was the 21st highest grossing film. Number one for the year of 1981 was Superman 2, followed by Stripes. Yeah, Superman 2, let me rephrase. The number one highest grossing film of 1981 was Superman 2. It pulled in $108 million that year. Stripes was at number two with $85 million. Excalibur was at number six, pulling in $34 million. Um, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark was number 14, making $21 million for 1981. But Nighthawks was again at 21, making $14.9 million. Um, $14.9 Wow. I mean, okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting. So yeah, no worries. No worries. You're fine. Yeah, it basically didn't do that great in the box office. Um, I don't see any information on budget or any or anything to that effect. Um, yeah, but going back to the whole box office reporting, there's only 56 movies reported for the highest grossing films of 1981. Whereas you look at any other year, there's like three or 400 movies listed. So it's probably a combination of there weren't producing as many movies and that not as many movies were being reported but like i said so it's very thin on the box office section i'm done padding my section nigel do you have any trivia for this movie i got a little bit um tom kind of touched on a little bit of it um yes this was the first uh one of the first post rocky movies uh it's a very interesting point in stallone's career it's kind of hard to talk about this movie without talking about a little bit about sylvester stallone's career in retrospect but um he wasn't trying so hard to be a dramatic actor. He was just trying to not be Rocky. Um, his Rocky one and two Rocky one was a massive hit, massive hit. And then the two movies he made after Rocky one were not very good, or at least they weren't hits, but his performance was okay. And I guess that's what the critics I have not seen those movies, but uh, which I think was, what was it? Fist. And what was the other one you listed? To um, me? hang on. I have to, well, uh, Paradise Alley. Yeah, so those movies weren't big hits. Rocky 1 was a huge hit. He goes and makes Rocky 2, which was another massive hit, and he was struggling to find his way. Uh, So he takes this role, and it was a modest hit. It's considered by some critics to be a little underrated, but it wasn't the hit Rockies 1 and 2 were. It honestly isn't until a year later that he makes Rocky 3 in Rambo First Blood Part 1, or just First Blood as it was known at the time. Uh, they were released the following year that Stallone's career would take off and he would become the Sylvester Stallone that we know. The big money mega hit star. I mean, Sylvester Stallone is rightfully up there. He's on the Mount Rushmore of action movie stars. There's no debate, you know. <laughs> the only debate would be where do you put his head on that Mount Rushmore? It's not even a case that he wouldn't even be on there. Um so, uh, but anyways, like I said, it's just, like I said, it's an interesting point in Stallone's career. It's a movie that I've, well, we'll get to that, that in expectations, but, um, going on it though, um, Universal Pictures edited the shit out of this film, cutting lots of the violence and such. There were two main reasons. One, they were trying to avoid an X rating, which were being doled out like candy back in the day. If even so much as shown a little bit more blood. We associate the X rating now, obviously, with pornography, but um, in the early 80s to the late 70s, the X rated was also used for ultra violent movies, movies that we do consider to be pretty violent today, like the Saw franchise or Hostel, Human Centipede, very disturbing, violent films that have a hard R would absolutely be rated X in 1981. So that was one reason why they edited the shit out of this film. They were trying to avoid an X rating. Another reason why, and this is tragic in hindsight is they felt audiences wouldn't be able to connect with the concept of international terrorism hitting the United States, especially in a city like New York. Hmm. Oof. <laughs> wait 20 years, fellas. Yeah. Wait tw- almost 20 years to the day. You know, wasn't that well, like just a few years after the world trade center, like bombings? No, that was in the nineties. Yeah. The was that, world I thought there was something that happened in the seventies. It might have been, but the, the concept of this, like, I guess I've not seen this film, but I guess Rutger Hauer is his terrorist is based on a real terrorist name that was named. Um, oh, yeah, that was 93. My bad. Yeah, I can't think of his name, the real terrorist that he's modeled after, but he was a really bad guy, but he operated almost exclusively in Europe. So the idea that someone would 
be able to launch a terrorist attack, a devastating terrorist attack in the United States was foreign to a lot of people um, in the late 70s and the early 80s and pretty much up until the mid 90s. So Mm -hmm. um, because the first like that I can remember, there was the first real major terrorist attack that I can really remember is the Oklahoma City bombings. Yeah, well, that was 94. Five, wasn't it? Yeah, that was after yeah. the um, because yeah, the World Trade Center bombings. I'm reading right here because I I barely I remember it. the first World Trade Center bombings because I wasn't paying attention to news at the time. It was ninety three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that's that's one reason why it was edited to shit. X rating and the whole concept of terror or international terrorism hitting the United States. That's also why the movie's so short tonight. This is one of the shortest films we've watched on this program. Um, it's only 99 minutes, but the original cut of the film was two and a half hours. Ooh. So if that gives you any idea of how much was cut, Man. it went from two and a half hours to 99 That's minutes. Rough. Almost an hour. Yeah. It's almost a whole hour of the film has been removed. Jesus God. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of Sylvester Stallone's career, this is the first movie in which Sylvester Stallone plays a police officer. He has since gone on to play a cop in many of his film roles. From the 80s and 90s, including last week's Tango and Cash, uh, Demolition Man, Judge Dredd, Cobra, The Specialist, Copland, and Stopper, My Mom Will Shoot. <laughs> Another well, movie we've got to get to. Absolutely not. <laughs> hey, well, maybe, maybe we could get to it, but I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> Definitely not a destination. No. No. Yeah. Uh, in preparation for their roles as New York City street cops, Billy D. Williams and Sylvester Stallone spent several weeks at night with the New York City street crime unit, the Nighthawks. It was, and it still might be, a term or a nickname used to describe the cops that worked the night shift, especially beat cops. No confirmation of Rutger Hauer shadowed any terrorists to prepare for his role. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Incidentally, just as a kudos to both D- Billy D and uh, Stallone, we're talking um, 80s New York City, which was not the best place to live. Yeah, pre Giuliani New York City, like late 1970s, early 1980s New York City. Mm-hmm. No, not not the place you think it to be. It's uh, yeah, more Gotham City than anything at the time. Yeah, watch Taxi Driver. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tom, you mentioned all the different directors and stuff. I couldn't find the story as to why there were so many directors like I could with Tango and Cash. That one was a novel and it was amazing. But I know that Gary Nelson was the original director. He left the project. Bruce Malmuth took over production, but Malmuth couldn't make it to the shoot right away. He couldn't make it to shoot the train chase. There's a train chase in the film. So Stallone actually directed the chase himself so to, that the, they wouldn't miss a day of shooting. And this actually caused trouble with the Directors Guild of America. The Guild ruled states that a Directors Guild member cannot be fired so an actor can take over directing a film in which he or she is starring. So the producers asked for and received special permission for Stallone to be able to shoot the scene. Yeah. And a nice one last bit of trivia that I found interesting because we've tried to use the, the this movie to connect other movies before. But um, this movie was originally planned as the French Connection 3. This was going to be the third French Connection film. And it would have seen Popeye Doyle teaming up with a wisecracking cop, possibly played by Richard Pryor. But and the main plot would be the same. I guess Popeye Doyle would be trying to find this terrorist with Richard Pryor cracking one-liners. Wisely, though, Gene Hackman showed reluctance to do the third movie, uh, which, I mean, if that was going to be the concept of Popeye Doyle teaming up with this wisecracking cop, I'm so glad they didn't do that because that would have been a horrible way to end the French Connection movies. Like, the second one's not nearly as good as the first, but... No, no. So, the idea was scrapped. Universal Pictures later acquired the rights to the storyline and then just reworked the script. But yeah, this movie was originally supposed to be French Connection 3. I'm really glad they didn't go that route. They shouldn't have been a French Connection 2, but we'll talk about that if ever we get to that movie. Yeah, so that's all I really got. I got a couple of other bits of trivia, but I'm going to wait till we get into the movie because some of them are kind of spoilery and none of us have seen this. So I don't want to give away what I accidentally read. So <laughs> <laughs> I should love yeah. it when you do that. It's a 40 year old movie, so I'm not going to get too bent out of shape that I got spoiled. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, but it's still kind of like one of those like, oh, I wish I'd have known that before. I OK, never mind. Of course, it was in the era of big reveals, too. Mm. So. So that's all I've got for trivia. And I don't want to give away too much because I know we all haven't seen this film. And so we've all got some expectations going in. Um, Josh, what are your expectations um, going into this film that all three of us haven't seen? Well, um, I don't know. 
You said this is after Rocky. This is after Rocky 2 as well, because Rocky 2 was 80, wasn't it? Yes, Rocky 2 is 80. Yeah, so like pre-Rocky 3 Rocky. I don't, know, I, I don't really have any major expectations. I'm not expecting a lot, but like I'm trying to visualize Rocky before he became the parody that is Rocky. Or, St- or Stallone <laughs> before he is the parody Stallone, you know, because Rocky one and two are definitely a lot different than the remaining Rockies. Rocky three and beyond are more like Tango from Tango and Cash. Like I'm expecting kind of a serious act- acting out of him. I don't really know any Billy D. Williams movies outside of Empire. The only Billy D. Williams movies I know of that I've seen is Ladies Man, um, Batman, Batman Returns. He was in that one, right? Nope. No. He wasn't in Batman Returns? No. I know he was in the first one. And then, uh, obviously, Star Wars. So I'm not very familiar with Billy D. Williams' work outside of those franchises. But just expecting a beat cop movie from the 70s. So I really don't know. But I am looking forward to watching Nithix. <laughs> <laughs> watching what? what? <laughs> yes, repeat that once more, Josh. Nithix? <laughs> no, the other thing. Nithix? <laughs> okay. Nithox. Nithox. Um, Nithox. I'm. I don't know what to expect out of this film. I've been. Re- what I've been reading about it over the last couple of weeks is that it's incredibly underrated. Um, that it's it deserves a little bit better than it was. And apparently, almost anyone involved in the production, up to it, like Sylvester Stallone and Rutger Hauer, and like everyone, they have been begging for years for an unedited cut of this film. And it's, it doesn't exist yet. Like they want to see the original, like two, two and a half hour cut of this film. Um, so I, but I've been hearing that this movie is underrated. So I'm, I don't know what to expect though. I have, this isn't a, the classic that the thing ended up becoming. And it's not, it's more of an underground cult classic instead of like the thing becomes a mainstream cult classic. If you can call it mainstream cult is kind of an oxymoron, but still, <sighs> I don't know. I'm on one hand. I'm expecting a pretty decent film, but on the other hand, I know our track record on movies. All three of us haven't seen. So I'm a little nervous, but yeah. it does have a 70% on rotten tomatoes. So yeah, but that's critics. That's not quite audience. Right. But I'm just saying it, you know, and I think audience score is a little skewed because I think audiences, when they go back, they may watch this film after discovering Stallone later in his career. Like they, they watch the Rocky movies, the Rambo movies and the other movies that he made, you know, judge dread and tango and cash and all that. And they probably watch this expecting some of that and not realizing that Stallone's career had early installment weirdness. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tom? Um, I cannot get past the hour of cutting that they've done to this film. That's a whole act. And then some, gone and it's not removing like two or three pages from a five page like bit there's a lot of plot and character development and interaction that you're never going to get and acting notwithstanding there's context that's just going to be gone i don't know i don't think it's going to be terrible I don't think it's going to be the worst thing we've ever seen. It's not going to be Swashbuckler. But I know I'm going to see those gaps and it's just going to impact me. So I don't think it's going to be the best film. And I don't think it's going to be turned around at the end like it was with Tango and Cash. Where there was stuff cut, but they kept the important things, which were the one-liners and the explosions. Mm -hmm. This is going to be a character sort of film. And you need those scenes with the characters to make the film. Without those, it's just a go from point A to point B to point C to point D and movie. Uh, That's my fears. Those are my expectations on the film. Yeah. So, I mean, like one thing we've all hammered on is or talked about is that uh, it is this is Stallone before he becomes Stallone. Yeah, that's why I wanted to do this list is because yeah. this is a movie I've always wanted to see because it's it's pre-Rambo Stallone. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when did he come out with Rambo? What year was that? 1982 is Rambo first. Rambo. Blood. So, so it's he, one year after this film. Yeah. Yeah, 1983 was Rocky three. Yeah. But even go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, so it's like I'm just going to line it up. So we got 1980. He did Rocky two. 1981. He did Nithix. 
1983, he did uh, Rocky th- or Rambo. Rocky. 19, 1982, he did Rambo, First Blood. And then 1983, he did, uh, damn, he was pumping out a movie a year. So yeah. Rocky 2 is 1982, or Rocky 3 is 1982. Was it? I thought it was 83. Yeah, no, it's release dates, 19, May 18th, 1982. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I had my dates wrong. Yeah, Rocky Three and Nate Rock, First Blood were released the first the same year, which is incredible because Rocky Three was right when the series was getting ready to jump the shark. I honestly think it jumped the shark with Rocky Three. I love the movie, but I think that's when he becomes the uh, stereotype Stallone. See, I, I don't think he becomes the cartoon character until Rocky Four. I actually think Rocky three is a really good sequel to Rocky. And it actually, I'd love to get to that film someday because there's a huge story behind that Mm -hmm. film. That's awesome. Like, um, it was just like an all or nothing kind of thing for Stallone, like to do that. And it's so weird that actually Rocky three outgrossed Rockies one and two combined Yeah, Mm -hmm. when it came out and which was unheard of at the time because normally sequels don't outgross the original like that, especially the third one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we do see that now, but not yeah. back then. But I honestly think that the Rocky three is when he becomes the caricature because that's when the montage just got really big. It wasn't as mm-hmm. emotional as the first two, mm-hmm. um, at least the way I felt it was. Because I mean, I don't he, know. I think the scene where Mick, where Mickey dies and he loses to Clubber in that first fight, I think that's just fucking brutal as hell. I'm not saying there isn't any in there. I just think that that's this movie where he becomes the caricature, mm-hmm. like he's mm-hmm. full on stereotype caricature in Rocky four. Yeah, but I still think he could like in Rocky Three. He still does a lot of really good acting. He does in Rocky Three. Like I'm when not... he balls his eyes out when Mickey dies, like that's some genuinely good acting there. It's hard enough to cry on camera. It's hard enough to just ball your eyes out like that and make it look like you're absolutely grief stricken. Like that's really hard to do. I'm not doubting Stallone's acting ability, but I have recently rewatched Rocky Three, and it des- definitely doesn't hit as hard as some other scenes I've seen, not directly comparing Rocky, but I think that he was a different actor. Definitely first two Rocky films compared to the three, four and the remainder. But I'm just, I'm just saying like, I I watch his acting in Rocky three and I watch his acting again in Rambo. And both those movies came out in the same year. And he's amazing in my opinion, in both of them, like Rambo is so radically different from the rest of the series. It's so different from the rest of the series. And I remember as a kid, I hated it. I hated the first Rambo movie when I was a kid. In fact, I I wouldn't watch it for the longest time. Like I just did not like that film. I always started with the second one and just watched number two and number three all the time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I didn't, I was well into adulthood before I've really began to appreciate the first one. And before I'm like, this is a really good film. I mean, that's, just summarizes all of Stallone's careers right there. The early stuff was like, oh, this is slow. What's going on? Why is he talking and like not killing people? And then from, you know, after the everything else later, it's just explosions. You go to later careers. Cause I'm looking at Paradise Alley, which he did in 78. And it's, it looks interesting. It does look interesting. It's low rated, but I mean, it's kind of got a, He's got a weird on the waterfront look to him. It's about living in the slums of New York in 1940s. And I hope we find a way to get to that one in the future. But it looks like he's he tries in that one. He tries to be a character, not just, you know, Sylvester Stallone. Honestly, I'm looking forward to this movie just to see that aspect. Because this is like, like Dan says, this is early Sylvester Stallone in... uh the eighties. I mean, he hasn't peaked yet. He definitely has not peaked yet in the eighties. Or he hasn't realized that no one really wants to see me as an actor. They just want to see me as Rocky. They want to see me with my shirt off. Yeah. They want to see me with my shirt off and compare me to Arnold. Who's cause that was truly a, uh, a, uh, I will say this out of the two muscle men. I think Stallone's a better actor than Arnold. Oh yeah. Oh, I think that's I think a given. Down. Yeah. Uh, still, Arnold definitely you know, was the box office draw though. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Right. Least- that's the word. That was a rivalry for the ages. Damn it. Words come oh. hard tonight. And actually, even to this day, he's in his 70s now and he's still in high demand. Oh, yeah. Like Sylvester. And I know that, yeah, he's been doing the Expendables movies a lot lately, which is kind of like he's become the action movie equivalent to Adam Sandler, mm-hmm, where mm-hmm. he just kind of gets his friends together and they film a movie. And unlike Adam Sandler, though, his movies are making money. So, <laughs> you know, they, say what you want about the varying quality of the Expendables films. They make money. Um, yeah, but the last one was seven years ago. 
I know it is hard to believe that they've had this really rough time getting the uh, fourth one made. I mean, I thought they'd be turning those things out until those guys are in the walkers. But I understand also, like, they're all at different points in their careers. So, yeah, Jason Statham definitely wasn't at max Jason Statham in 2010. Yeah. And like, you know, I know Arnold's kind of like he's definitely more or less retired from acting like he only does little bit roles here and there now. But I, I don't know. I just want to see this movie because I just want to see early Stallone. And plus, I'm looking forward to seeing Billy D. Williams in a. Uh another dramatic film because his early career they look pretty solid i mean lady sings the blues mahogany i know we didn't pick it but brian's song is considered one of the saddest and one of his best uh movies he ever made that movie started as a made for tv movie and it was so popular like no put that on the screen make people pay to see that shit hmm. fuck nice. why are they we letting them see it for free so seeing him in a dramatic role, not just being in a cape. I'm looking forward to that too. Yeah, same here. Honestly, I think out of out of all the movies we've ever watched, where the three of us haven't seen it, this one has one of the biggest casts. All three of the leading men in this movie, uh, Billy D. Williams, Sylvester Sloan, and Rucker Howard, all pretty good actors. So, well, we thought the same thing about Dead Calm, and um... Dead Dead Calm did not have the star power this one had. This is true. I was going to make the argument of Swashbuckler as well, but same point with the same exception. Yeah, of James all that Earl one Jones. had was Ray Romano's dad and James Earl James Jones. Earl Jones. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. This one's got quite a bit. So we at least have that much. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the best choice of director, but everything else around it's pretty. Yeah. Definitely, pretty we're all different. looking forward to it. So yes, but we're generally like cautious, but a little hopeful when we go into this film. Not a lot of people. Have had the same experience, though. Would you like to know about their experience with this film? Do we have a choice? Yeah, if we have to. <laughs> I love that me and Dan had the same attitude. So, I have scoured all of IMDb for the choicest of reviews on Nighthawks. And I will be quizzing you on them. I have picked five. And I will go one at a time. I will give you the review. And it's between one to ten stars. Wherever guesses closest without going over uh, gets the point. If you get on the money, you get two points. Person with the most points at the end of the questions wins and gets to do trivia next week. And it should be qualified, of course. Like you're allowed within two points um, going over anything else, it goes to whoever was lowest. So if there are no further questions, let us begin with Dan. Dan. This one comes from Bob Bear, the title of which says, The Off Switch Was Never So On. I'm going to say 7 out of 10. Gosh. Is that one more time? The Off Switch Was Never So On. I'll say 8. Dan is closest. It was a one-star review. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. I thought about going low, too, but yes, I really it... did not. Okay. No, nope. you should have, though. You should have. I should have. I was like, do I go above or low? I'll go above. This, this could be a big one. Now, hopefully you'll get a better chance with this one. This one comes from Questel18592, who says, I managed to catch this on Netflix, and I think that's the best way to watch this. Find it streaming somewhere and use it as background fodder. Wow. I'm going to go three. Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm going to go one. Josh is closest. This is a six-star review. (laughs) These were the nice things some people said. All right. So this one, Nigel, comes from R.S. Brandt, who says, Director Bruce Malmuth's work here was competent enough to make one wonder just a little if he didn't deserve better projects than he got after this. Five. Josh. Say it one more time. Director Bruce Malmuth's work here was competent enough to make one wonder just a little if he didn't deserve better projects than he got after this. Dan said five. Yes. I'll go four. Dan is closest. This was a nine star. Jeez. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, I can't win. I go under or go above you, you win. I go below you, you win. <laughs> well, 
Josh, here, I mean, this one's coming to you. Maybe you can still come back if you get it on the number. So, but Josh. Ta- or he's got, got me by one point right now. Yes, he does. But there's, it's three questions down. There's still two more to go, so you can still pull it off. But this question is to you. This one comes from Dan Fox. <laughs> 23193. That's Fox, F U C H S. The title to their review Sure, it's crap, but it's my crap. Eight. Nigel. Sure, it's crap, but it's my crap. Josh said eight. I'm going to say five again. Josh is on the money. That is an eight star. So Josh pulls ahead. Ooh. So now we're at the last question. Nigel, if you get it right on the money, you can win this. Otherwise, you can probably tie it. This one comes from Real Cheese, who says, In the end, Nighthawks is a movie you're bound to like, either a little bit or a lot. Considering the high ratio of garbage that has and will continue to spew out of Hollywood, I guess that's not such a bad thing. This is a really confusing word. It is. It's mm-hmm. like, I, don't, I can't tell if he hates it or loves it or is indifferent towards it. Read it one more time. In the end, Nighthawks is a movie you're bound to like, either a little bit or a lot, considering the high ratio of garbage that has and will continue to spew out of Hollywood. I guess that's not such a bad thing. Seven. Josh? I'm going to say five. Wowzers. Dan, you were right on the money. That nice. Was a seven star review. And whoosh. I win. I do not <laughs> lose. I win. And that's good because I didn't have uh, a six question picked out. I was going to have to go off the cuff. I am just on a losing streak. <laughs> you really are. You suck. <laughs> I mean, you'll turn it around. <laughs> Tom, he sucks. I know. It's embarrassing now. I still haven't been shut out. This is true. Doesn't matter. That was not- embarrassing. You I know, only Tom- loser, only losers hang on to meaningless stats. <laughs> so Nigel, way to go. Josh, you, you kind of made it a teeth clencher at the end, getting all the money with that eight. But at the end of the day, the music was playing and Tom play the music. Welcome back to another undercover episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and counter-terrorism instructor, Tom. Now, the first rule of being a counter-terrorist agent, don't be a dick to everyone else. Look, I don't care what the last guy said. Keep your shit in check. I'm looking at you, Lando Calrissian. Mm. 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 But thank you for checking in with us here at the fire pit. We're going deep undercover again to suss out all the suspects while the fire pit swings into adventure. We've got a clear shot at Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark and by God, we're not going to waste it. And speaking of wasting shots, let's see how the team is handling their shot at solving their own mystery. It was hot, too hot for July. The nation was celebrating its bicentennial and I just wanted to celebrate a nap. We tracked down the perp to the subway. Place smelled like cheap liquor, day old socks. Reminds me of my ex-wife. Here I was listening to this guy yammer on about how he saw the perp get on the number seven train. And all I wanted was a bottle of number seven bourbon. Dan, what are you talking about? You're gonna ruin our best lead. Shh. Yeah, so like Joey Numbers is the one that took all that stuff from the Fire Pit Podcast Studio. He's heading to Queens with it. If you want, I'll take it to his nightclub in Chelsea. Like, for real, that would be totally awesome. Like, for real. Way to be a cool cat with 5-0. Respect, bro. Like, I mean, we're totally gonna crack this case wide open. We'll name the thieves and the terrorists. Yeah, it's like catching a big swole on your best board with your best girl watching on the beach. Dude, yeah. for real, bro. For real. You know, you guys keep mentioning terrorists. How are you sure that they're in cahoots with these thieves? Yeah, I mean, does it really make sense that thieves would be working with terrorists? I mean, I think the whole terrorist thing is a red hair. We should ignore those three guys completely. You mean those jokers that burnt down that place in Antarctica? Oh yeah! 
yeah, yeah, I know those three Mama Lukes. Yeah, I, in fact, I got a picture of those turkeys right here in my wallet. Just me giving it in my back pocket, unsuspicious like to get it. I had enough of this guy jawjacking and getting nowhere. He was reaching into his pocket, probably to get a friend to help get involved in his argument. I had a friend to speak for me, too. Fortunately, he's a man of few words. Six, to be precise. Jesus Christ! Oh, 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 hey, yo, what the hell? My wallet! Dude, not cool, bro. He's running away. Yeah, now we gotta, like, totally chase after him now. Let's go, man. Uh, uh, I, I gotta lay down for a second. Okay, um, instead of running after them, why don't we run and catch the subway? I mean, it is only 50 feet away here. So on to the nightclub then? What's happening? <coughs> Dude, not cool, bro. Can't smoke inside. Totally not cool. That was Tom. Always giving society the middle finger. He was a good editor, a good friend. What a lousy human being. If he put the effort into finding this perp as he did into editing a know-nothing podcast, we'd have this case solved and I could be down at Larry's drinking a scotch and working on my next ex-wife. Dan, we can hear you. Yeah, keep something to yourself, please. And as for Josh, well, let's just say if he ever used his head for something besides a hat rack, a lot of his problems would go away. I didn't have the heart to tell him that, though. Some things a man has to figure out for himself. Besides... Josh has all the inner maturity of a 14-year-old boy that just found his old man's stash of hustlers and hooch. He sees how it works, but hasn't got a clue how it all fits together. We can hear you. We'll deal with this later. Come on, let's go to the next car. Hey, yo, yo, Dan, Dan, real quick over here. Thanks for the compliment about editing. I work a real hard job on that one, so thanks, dude. My, I really needed that. Thanks. Now back to the case. And my dad has a penthouse. Thank you very much. Oh, for God's sake. Well, they're definitely getting their cardio in on this journey. And they clearly needed it too. But if you want to run our audience through some of the benefits of your products, or if you want to run through some movie ideas that you have, or if you just want to run your mouth off in a private manner, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Dot com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line, as well as the reason for your email. Whether it's for an ad, a list of movies for us to try, some corrections on trivia, or observations from a previous episode, or whatever else there might be, and send it our way! From there, we'll read it, spend several days undergoing intense and rigorous training to study it intimately, send it out to the field with our top agents, and never respond. <laughs> we honestly spent so much time in training about the email, we completely forgot what it was about. <sighs> Sorry! But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. All right, that's as much training as I can fit into this segment. It's time to let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. So it's been 45 minutes and nothing has happened. Well, that's not true. Um, yeah, the bad guy shaved his beard, Tom. Come on. Yeah, yeah, and they went. That we got to watch them go to night school for six weeks in real time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I take that back. Nothing of importance has happened. Oh well, yeah, duh. Although it is funny, though, you guys mentioned Star Trek in Space: The Final Frontier. This movie has Persis Kambata in it, and she was uh, Ileana in Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Oh, that means something to me. Man, I, I don't even need to look for the background music for our skits now. This is it. This is it right here. Holy cow. Well, there's another copyright strike. Thanks, YouTube. <laughs> I'm the reason why we'll never get monetized. Is that Stallone? It looks like Stallone. Now with those hips. For the audience, it's a person in a dress. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's Stallone. I mean, those calves, maybe... If that is Stallone, Dan, I'm going to start ha questioning your choice of movies. Whoa! Holy God! God damn, I nailed that. 
And he still had the beard, too. That's a great mask. <laughs> There's two movies in a row we've had cross-dressing uh, superstars. Well, I can officially check off seeing Tango and Cash and Drag. See? This list is full of bucket lists. That's not a list I ever wanted to check off, though. You just didn't know you wanted to check it off. I didn't know it was on the list. <laughs> he's no Kurt Russell. I hope they kill that douche just because he's got a turtleneck on. He's not. It's not because he's a bad guy. It's just he looks like a douchebag in that turtleneck. I have a feeling that thing he was pushing under the uh, counter was was not his backpack. What makes you say that? Because it blew up. I think you're reading too much into it. International terrorism, gentlemen. It's a worldwide organization. I would think the term international would make it worldwide, sir. Billy D, smooth as always. Mm-hmm. No, let me help you with that door. And your panties. No, no, no. He just helps her with the door. She willingly gives over her panties. I don't want to hear that you warn us. Not one word. Understand? One word. <laughs> Safety orientation, which is necessary when you're dealing with civilians, but is catastrophic when dealing with terrorists. The most important rule is hesitation kills. Hesitation must be removed from the policeman. Wow. That ages well. Who? Just go in and shoot no matter what. Don't worry about public relations or, you know, rights. Just shoot them. Wow. Oh, this movie is so awesome. We're watching PowerPoint slides. This is all taking place over like five days. They have not left this room. <laughs> yeah. I like how they're showing like Rutger Hauer's characters like taking days to establish himself in New York. And they've been in this same meeting that entire time. They have been in their days. They're wearing different clothes each time. <laughs> My God. If he has changed his face, he will be more dangerous than ever. So why do you keep showing us this one, sir? Please, sir. Forget it. It was a big play anyway. How do you know? Because I'm beginning to know how the son of a bitch thinks. How? <laughs> <laughs> and the silver drive the bus. This deal's getting worse all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. We got an obligatory Star Wars. Look at that cell phone. That's a radio. But yes. Hey guys, I'm gonna take a quick nap. Just wake me when it gets good. I can see why police movies changed in the 80s. Real police work is boring on film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shock. When the walls fell. <laughs> Yeah, let's watch this lower all the way down to the ground. Yep, every single foot. We're going to make sure we record it all and show it on screen. <laughs> yep, and we're going to watch the hookup. Yep, every single bit of it. Let's watch it through the binoculars for a bit. And it, heisting it up. Yeah, Stallone's had a fear of heights his entire life. This fucking stunt scared the shit out of him. Is that why every single second of it's on screen? <laughs> like, by God, I was out there. I, I, every single second's gonna be on on screen for me then. This movie's bringing out Grumpy Josh. I want that bastard. What bastard? What did he do? He was the one that chased him. No one makes me run? Is that his whole revenge? Well, no one said he was a good terrorist. That you're training us to be nothing but assassins. And the only difference between him and us would be the badge. I don't know about you. I don't know about the rest of these men, but I didn't join the force to kill people. Oh, for Christ's sake. Then why else did you become a cop? <laughs> Whee! More realistic bus scene than speed? Well, I mean, it crashed. <laughs> it didn't clear the jump. Why would he go visit his ex-wife? I mean, he has no idea the circumstances of their divorce. There was a scene earlier in the film where he asked for all the information on the cops that were chasing him or something like that. So he would know that this is his ex-wife, but I don't think he would know their, I don't think he would know the circumstances of their relationship. Yeah, yeah for but, all he could know the, uh... Yeah, for all he knew, the divorce was nasty. He's yeah. like, yes, please kill her. Mm -hmm. Save me these fucking alimony payments. In fact, I'll come over and I'll help you. Yeah. You think this is yeah. Stallone and drag again? Oh, please, please, may it be Stallone in drag again. Oh, my God, please. You know what? I didn't think about that, but they haven't shown any close-ups. Yeah. Uh, oh, please, may this be one redeeming quality of this fucking film. 
please, please, please. Turn around please. and be a beard with the long wig. wig. Please do it. It <laughs> is. So oh, my oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh. Well, not every movie on my list was going to be a good one. <laughs> and now, back to the episode. <laughs> oh, right. boy. So- we just finished Nithix. <laughs> oh. So, Tom, tell us, what did you think of this movie? I have never pitied a film so badly or so much. <laughs> I get it. I mean, they cut an hour off of this film. They still felt like they could have cut another hour with what <laughs> they had left to work with. Oh, my. This felt honestly like the pilot episode to attack the TV series about the elite anti-terrorist force because it had no teeth to it, nothing for it. And it's not even the movie's fault. They had to meet a rating. So they cut all the good stuff and all they had left to fill the standard hour and a half was the padding. I hope to God they kept the original cuts or the original scenes and someone digs up this film for what it could have been because... What did they have? They cut all the action and gore because they had to keep the X rating. Oh my God, What what's in a box in someone's attic? It could have been something. And that makes me feel bad. Um, I'll add to my thoughts, but I guess the summary of everything, of my exhaustion, because I am very exhausted watching this go nowhere film. I don't hate it because it wasn't its fault. It was the fault of the people who made the final decision and the studio. So, Nigel, what are you what are you thinking? Real police work is boring. <laughs> it's boring to watch on screen. I know that most cops don't get into long shootouts in their careers and they don't fly helicopters into like large gun battles and mm-hmm. whatnot, but that does make for a fun, more fun movie. Mm-hmm. Um Nothing frustrates me more than when I'm watching a movie and I can see the good film that's trying to get out of it. And that's how I felt watching this. I felt like there was a much better movie somewhere, but it wasn't this one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you're right, Tom. I think they cut out all the good stuff. And the only thing they had left to work with was padding and filler. That's why that's why that like classroom scene feels like it takes six weeks in real time. (laughs) You know, it's like where they had so many establishing moments like they had the intro with uh stallone in in the drag and taking down the the criminals at the subway or the train station and then they had the terrorists blow up the building or the the bookstore whatever it was then they went back to new york and had stallone and billy d williams bust up a drug room or something like that then they went back to london and had terrorists do more terrorist stuff then they went back to new york and had the cops doing things like so many different a character establishing scenes. There's like five of them. The first 20 minutes of the film, and you're like, you don't need this many scenes to establish your characters. You know, it just was really frustrating to watch. So yeah, this movie was just clumsily edited together and it just really dragged. It just felt like all it was, was filler. It's kind of funny. It was, it was it Persis Kambata's in this movie. And you said this movie felt like a pilot to a 1970s show and Persis Kambata's in Star Trek, the motion picture, which also feels like a pilot to a television show <laughs> that got expanded into a motion picture, but not very well. So before I go off on too long of a tangent, we will come discuss things together. But I'd like to get Josh's thoughts, even though I'm going to go ahead and think I already know what they're going to be. But you know what? Let's just confirm it. Josh, tell us how you loved this film. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shit, put me on the spot. I loved it. It was great. Most excellent pacing, fantastic plot. I loved the acting. This movie was terrible, and I can't believe I actually said those previous things. <laughs> no, this movie was garbage. I don't forgive it for anything. Um, I think it was just garbage. Yeah, it was bad. I did not like this movie at all. It was slow. Scenes just didn't make sense. It wasn't cohesive at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, you guys say you see the movie that was in there that could have been, yes, Tom, I don't know why you forgive it for that for some reason, but no, this is a shit movie. That's like saying Justice League is good, but the Snyder Cut is amazing. No, no, this this is shit. This movie is absolute shit. There might be a better cut out there, 
And I don't doubt that there is, but I guarantee you that every single movie out there has a, a cut of it that is an hour longer because that's like saying, oh yeah, bread's made of dough. <laughs> this is what they released. So this is what they're standing by as their work. And I have to say that, yeah, I wouldn't want to stand by this as my work. So, but I think that, yes, there is potentially a better movie out there, but what we saw tonight wasn't it. Like, seriously, it it was all filler. It was just garbage. It was the entire thing was trash. Like, you spent five minutes walking up a uh, friggin' fire escape. Seriously. Or let's spend 15 minutes on this chase scene that literally all they're doing is running. Scene of the bad guy running. Scene of the good guy running. Scene of the bad guy running. Scene of the good guy running. That's all it is. It's slow. It's monotonous. I think that if there was more release to it, it could have been a lot better. But I, I think back to uh, Explorers. Remember how they say that they had to rush through editing on the final part of that film? Mm-hmm. They at least had something there in that movie that we could watch. This one was just poorly put together. I, I just didn't like it. It's just I will never not be watching this movie again <laughs> at any point in my life. If they release a uh, director's cut or an extended edition... I'll let Dan tell me how it is. I'm not going to watch the <laughs> So what you're saying is... To turn a phrase, hated it. <laughs> so Josh loved this film. Greatest picture of the journey. Greatest picture of the podcast. I loved it. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it could just be that Tango and Cash was such an amazing movie that anything we watched was going to not live up to it. We did kind of all agree that that peaked at Pentango and Cash last week. It just kind of, yeah, it did. You know, I will say that I'll say this. I've seen cop movies from the seventies. Like, you know, I actually can see where this would have originally been the third French connection, French connection film. Cause it did kind of have some of the same beats as the French connection movies. Not as good, though, but it, I can see where it was originally a French Connection 3 film because like that long chase scene with them running, that was like right out of the French Connection. Like that's, oh, yeah. you know, and a lot uh, of procedural stuff, too. Yeah, but I can see why like cop movies in the 80s turned into Lethal Weapon because Lethal Weapon is in no way realistic, but it is a little more fun to watch. It's a little more easier to get into. But that doesn't take away from the cop dramas of the 70s and the 80s that were like this. This just this one's just not well put together. It's badly put together. Like I said, it's just edited all wrong. It's just it feels like it's just all filler. That whole bit in the fucking classroom was like, Jesus Christ, am I taking this class or are the characters? Because I feel like I'm taking this class. Dude, they were in that scene forever, and they changed wardrobes like three times. I yeah. Just to say, hey, look, we're in this court, this class, and we're showing the same goddamn slide every day. Well, look like, at this guy. He doesn't have the same face. He went through plastic surgery. Yeah, it's like... Now look at the picture again. He's not going to be the same guy. He had plastic surgery. Yeah, they keep saying that. If he has changed his face, he's the most... Dating. Like, why do you keep showing us this picture? And the whole argument with the salvo, it's like, you're so weak as cops. Cops are weak and pathetic. They won't just shoot first. It's like, yeah, we got five minutes ago when you said that. Yeah. This is the fourth time you said it. And I get it. It was it was only supposed to use one take, but they couldn't use any of the other stuff. I forgive this movie, Josh, because this may have not been the best film because I saw a whole lot of cliches here going on. But mm -hmm. at least it could have been potential to be a fun film. Yeah. Dude, 21 Bridges was a better movie than this. Yo, oh, yeah. Yo, no. I yeah, yeah. No, no, no one's. I'm not saying that's not. This movie is definitely not as good as 21 Bridges was. I mean, at the 45 minute mark in 21 Bridges, the plot had kicked in. Yeah. Like this movie, 45 minutes in, they're still in fucking school. It's yeah, like. I don't, I don't forgive this movie for anything. I understand that it could have been a better movie, but what I got, it's like you, you go to the restaurant, food metaphor, take a drink. <laughs> and you order what you're hoping to be a steak and they send out a cow pie. Right. And but I'm just saying that what they edited together, like the chef can only do so much with the ingredients that he's told he has to use. And yes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a what happened. A cow pie and a steak both come from a cow. Right. But I'm just <laughs> like, I can see what Tom's saying though. Like this movie was cut and edited to hell and it was cut because the first cut got an X rating. So they had to cut it again to avoid an X rating. And like I said, in the seventies and the eighties, horror movies and slasher films definitely fell into this trap. But so many of these films got cut because of the X rating X 
didn't always mean pornography or nudity. It usually it also meant violence. Yeah. But even that rating's kind of the kiss of death. So mm-hmm. yeah. To avoid that X rating, they had to cut a ton of the violence out of this film. And apparently it's supposed to be a lot more violent. From from what I read, that nightclub scene was originally almost something like out of the Terminator where he shot like five or six or seven people in that nightclub before he's, he bolted and ran off. Um, whereas like that was like in the Terminator. Well, although the Terminator comes out later, that was in 1984, but like the Terminator mowed down a bunch of people in that nightclub and all that, like that was yeah. supposed to happen in this film. He's supposed to sh- kill a bunch of people in the nightclub. Yeah. He only shot one person in the nightclub, right? Yeah. Yeah. Apparently yeah. the building he blew up in New York was actually supposed to have people in it. Um, originally, uh, his, his death scene at the end was supposed to be a lot more graphic. Uh, Stallone was going to use all six of those Magnum rounds and blow off chunks of his arm and blow his head open and all that. Um, like, cause they even built like a prosthetic Rutger Hauer head that it was supposed to explode and all that. It's like, yeah, the, the, a lot of the action violent bits got cut and they had to go with what they had. And probably the only thing they had left was establishing shots and fucking mm, uh, yeah. filler shit. So yeah, I will admit that final gun down scene of Rucker Howard's character did feel like something out of RoboCop, yeah. especially yeah. the way the blood was spraying and the body was just flailing. <laughs> but I, it's like I said, you, you can see the movie they wanted to make. Mm hmm. But- I the movie that we got was crap. If that was in there, it would have been a much better film. But I don't forgive the film for that. Yeah, I, mean, I can I can see why this isn't more fondly remembered. You know, what yeah. I mean? like like I said, I this movie was incredibly disappointing. I wouldn't even say that Twenty One Bridges was not disappointing to me. I expected a mediocre cop drama with Twenty One Bridges, and that's exactly what I got. So I'm okay. You go into McDonald's, you expect a, a McDonald's burger. You get a McDonald's burger. You yeah. can't complain about that. Mm-hmm. Um, however, this is a case of I went to a steakhouse and I got a McDonald's burger. Now I'm pissed. <laughs> so I don't know. I just it was the opposite of Tango and Cash. I expected Tango and Cash to be stupid. I was I was going to call it Lethal Weapon Zero. You know, all the Lethal Weapon flavor with, or none of the calories. And Tango and Cash was a really fun film. And this one was just so mm. blah. Yeah, yeah, just blah. Even going to like back to the steak um, McDonald's thing, it's like I, I wasn't expecting this movie to be great. I wasn't really expecting to love this movie, but I think if I would have liked this movie, it would have been, you know. Yeah. But it's like I feel like I still went to a McDonald's and ordered a cheeseburger and got a cow pie. And from my end, I was expecting more dramatic, something along the lines of French connection or more grim and gritty. We're yeah, talking like here. the violent, you know, more like kind of in the vein of Dirty Harry, but not to that level. Slower pace, I mean, better acting too. No offense to anyone in this. Well, actually, some offense to the people in this film. There was not a lot of nuance to the acting in this film. Stallone had the most nuance, but everyone else either went like zero to pissed off there was oh, yeah. no middle ground and the music also not much to write about Ugh. definitely tell it was what's his name's first film mm. yeah i don't know just uh, this movie was a nothing burger with nothing filling and nothing toppings and nothing fries it's just yeah i yeah. will give the movie this though i will give the movie this i love seeing billy d williams in a superman shirt yeah yeah but unfortunately it came with this movie and yeah, that's the catch. That's the catch. I would be curious to know if this is one of the first instances of somebody wearing a Superman shirt in TV or a movie. Um, not counting, you know, the not Superman counting Superman, movies. obviously, but like Superman shirt, like it's a shirt. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Probably. I mean, that kind of stuff was hard to come by back then. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You didn't just unless you were a kid, you didn't just walk around with a Superman shirt. So, and even yeah. then, it was those shirts were hard to find for kids. Like mm-hmm. they oh, yeah, really were. wasn't like today. I mean, like yeah, I remember seeing people walk around in like Superman, Batman, and you know Marvel shirts nowadays. It's like if you did that when you were in grade school, at least in the nineties, they would make fun of you. Yeah. So Billy D. Williams, trendsetter, head of the curve, as always. Yeah. Oh my God, in him although this film. I had another thought, but so okay, we we all are unanimous in our disdain of this movie. Yeah. This is a rare occasion where Josh is less forgiving of a film than I am. Where do we put this on our worst movies? Is this worse than Dead Calm or? How would you rank this, guys? No, this had this had better acting than Dead Calm, so I wouldn't say it. No, this isn't worse than Dead Calm, but it's 
Uh, it's I'm not. It's, to think. Yeah. It started and ended with Stallone in drag. <laughs> Dead calm started with a baby flying out the window and then Billy Zane getting his head exploded. I don't know. Uh, I think if I had to put it on there, which one would I rather watch? I would probably rather watch Dead Calm over this again. Mm. So I think I would put really? Dead Calm slightly above Nighthawks. I would really? put Dead I'm sorry, I would, I'm sorry, Nithix. I would put Dead <laughs> I would put Dead Calm ahead of this only because there's a Nicole Kidman nude scene. There is a Nicole Kidman nude yep. scene. And I know, I know, I live in the age of the internet. If I want to go see Nicole Kidman naked, I just it's a couple Google clicks away. But yeah, I'm I'm I would rather watch Dead Calm only because one, Nicole Kidman naked, and two, the the scene with the flare and Billy Zane's mouth is like, oh my god. Yeah. It's like comes out of nowhere. Oh, and when they kill the dog, it's so like awesome. Yeah, but it comes out of nowhere. At least with this one, there's some build up to like the reveal. It's still loading in drag. Ha ha. Yeah, but this one had better acting than Dead Calm. I still that that scene in Dead Calm after they thought they got rid of Billy Zane, and then it just cuts to like the next morning and he's washing her hair and they're talking about having croissants and breakfast and you know, skinny dipping and all that. And you're like, you guys were just through a harrowing experience and you're going about life as normal. Like yeah. it's really, really, really was jarring that that ending for a dead calm was really jarring. This one, the ending was about what I expected it to be, but um, well, no, actually I was expecting it to go the route. Tom was predicting that he was going to kidnap the yeah. ex wife. And there was going to be a tense moment where he, this time he has to take the shot. Yeah. It wasn't until we didn't see her face for like the entire time they were showing her. I was like, Oh wait, this is Stallone and drag again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was a good call too, Josh. I was expecting like uh, Stallone to pop in from behind or something like that, but I'm glad they went that route. That's why I think this could have been a more fun film. The fact that they, even had this as an ending, there was going to be something w- more wild with this movie. And you know, I think it suffers from the same thing that 21 Bridges suffered from, is it took itself too seriously. I think if it would have been a little bit more fun, it would have been a lot better movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, this not was necessarily before have that... a comedic theme to it, but just not take itself seriously. Like, Billy D would have thrown out a couple one-liners here and there. I think it could have been a much better film. Yeah, yeah I, agree. I agree. I agree there. And if, if it had a little bit more action to it, it doesn't need to have, like, Die Hard or Lethal Weapon type action, but just a couple extra scenes of just something happening. Like, this whole movie was just a lot of nothing happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, yeah, that was kind of realistic police work going, you know, hitting the streets and saying, have you seen this person? No. OK. And then going asking the next person, have you seen this person? No. OK. And then going on. Asking, like that's that is actually real detective, real police work, but it's boring to watch. You could have just montage that cut it down. Trim, 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 trim. Yeah, we got to literally watch them go through and show who's do you have you seen this person? Have you seen in real time? Yeah. And they went to like five or six different nightclubs. But as we know, Stallone hadn't learned his montage trick yet. No, you no. Are right. Yes. He, he had to get to Rocky three and Rocky four is peak montage. There's mm-hmm. like five that yeah. almost that whole movie is told in montage, but yep. <laughs> and it's excellent. At least it, it is. Moves. Excellent. I want to get to Rocky four sometime because I have thoughts. <laughs> 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 I do. I just need to make that into a shirt. I have thoughts. I have a whole like rant about Rocky four and five that needs to be said on air one day. But... <laughs> I think you foreshadowed nay warned us about this a few times. I'm just the saying there's no way he's broke. It just doesn't make sense, but <laughs> save it for when we actually watch. Yeah, it. I want that's that's a juicy steak right there. Yeah, we need it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to lie, guys. Rocky four or and or Rocky five will be like a four hour episode <laughs> after Tom edits it, because <laughs> I'm going to go on a rant about Rocky's <laughs> situation. Well, maybe someday you'll get an opportunity. Hopefully we'll hit a Rocky movie here and there. I hope so. I mean, yeah, but you know what, though, this I'll, I'll end my thoughts with this. This is kind of par for the course with Stallone. Not every one of his movies was a hit. Not every one of his movies was great. So not every <laughs> single movie he makes is going to be Tango and Cash. Hell, I'd rather watch some of the, like his quote unquote bad films than this again. Like I'd rather watch Judge Dredd than this. Oh, oh I love yeah. Judge Dredd. That's a great movie. Yeah, well, it's considered one of his bad films though. But I'd rather watch Judge Dredd or I'd rather watch uh... Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. Yeah, I know. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Do now not let's commit us let's to not... that bit. Let's no. not push it. Let's not push it. But I'd rather watch maybe The Specialist or... or... That Formula One racing movie he did. Oh, God, that movie was awful. Or... Copland. Copland. That's actually... I like I like Copland. That's the one he put on like 40 pounds for, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 
Yeah, or I'd rather watch any of the Expendables movies than this. Like, just because something fucking happens in those films. Let's just put it like this. I would rather watch any movie that Sylvester Stallone has ever made over this one again. (laughs) Yes. I would rather watch Stop or My Mom Will Shoot Again than watch this. Even that uncredited porn movie that he was in that he was duped into doing? Yes. It's actually been credited. When I was looking up his uh, career, they he has an IMDb for it. So he now he does, but he used to not, and he used to be rather ashamed of it because he was rather duped for it. And I actually kind of feel bad for him. If you read, if you listen to the story of him having to do that movie, that's heartbreaking. It's literally a case of do this movie or starve. Hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't shame him for it because like, he was no, no. De- he was desperate and hungry and. I- yeah, you know what? You got to do what you got to do to pay the bills, man. Yeah, yeah. You got to do who you got to do to pay the bills. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But I think we've all uh, said our piece. Am I right? Yeah, oh, I think yeah. we're good. I've, I've said all I can say about this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, But I think that does it for tonight's show. As a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are made. Um, regular episodes, as always, Tuesday at 6 p.m., And please like and subscribe on uh, whatever medium you listen on. Um, We really appreciate it as uh, it'll up our rankings and make us more visible to new uh, listeners. We're always going to do this podcast regardless, but getting more listeners is always a nice little benefit. And also help out with that. Leave a review. If you do leave a review, we'll uh, definitely read it on the air. Uh, on the air we're not live but we'll read it on the podcast we definitely appreciate it and if you put those reviews out there like i said it'll up us in the rankings and we'll show up on searches and whatnot and it really helps us out a lot so we do appreciate that if you do that or just even if you just listen to it we appreciate that and be sure to join our discord channel as well the link is in the episode's description at firepit.podbean.com uh the link for the discord is discord.me forward slash fire pit you'll get notifications of new episodes and even better you can engage in discussions with us and other fans of the podcast including our dear friend rob from rob's custom pcs and Tarek thorn and danielle they're always in then i'm in discussions talking about were there our thoughts for right on the last movie we just watched way wrong on the last movie we just watched or, you know, everyone has different opinions. They're all wrong because we do the podcast. So, but yeah, join in the discord discussions and uh, it's a good time. Uh, hop on in. And if you want to just send us something a little more personal, you can email us at curtain call entertainment, Inc at gmail.com. You might've heard it mentioned once or twice in the interspersal. You know, if you want to send us a long message, short message, happy message, or a sad message, or just saying you enjoyed the episode like Tyrick Thorne did. Tyrick, appreciate the email, by the way. It's great to have feedback. But even if you didn't like the episode, email us anyways. It's up to you. Also, be sure to like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both are linked in this episode's description. And uh, I would like to give a shout out tonight to my buddy Tim. He, he sent me a text earlier this week. And he's like, this is as far as I've gotten in the latest episode, but do Firefox, LOL. So another endorsement for the movie Firefox with Clint Eastwood. Hmm. So uh, thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. And uh, this is your shout out that I told you I was going to give you. And a special shout out to the Fire Pit podcast. Um, We are celebrating our one year anniversary on Podbean, which is really when we effectively went live. I mean, we'd been recording for a few months by then and had a couple episodes out on a different platform, but we ran out of space and we weren't willing to pay for it. So Podbean has been hosting us now for a year by the time this episode comes out. So shout out to Podbean. You rock and thank you for being an awesome platform. Woohoo! One year. So, as always, thanks for listening. And I would like to shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Thank you very much for your continued support. And also shout out uh, my family for putting up with me watching all these movies, like back to back to back to back to back over the last couple weeks because of the vacations and and work obligations and whatnot. So uh, thanks for putting up with me and letting me do this. And also, because we're recording this episode right before Father's Day, I will give a special shout out to all the dads that listen to us and all the dads that are the all the would-be dads that listen to us so uh happy father's day to everybody and uh don't watch this movie for father's day <laughs> unless unless you hate your dad in which case don't yeah do yeah no one, no one deserves this yeah yeah watch tango and cash cooler movie anyways yes yes and from my end just happy father's day to my dad as well and i'd also like to shout out uh the 
tools we use to make this podcast possible. Zencaster. Zencaster is a recording program we utilize. Uh, we ditched Skype for Zencaster, and it has made all the difference. Our recordings are so much better. We have not lost an episode with Zencaster, unlike Skype. We do not pay for anything with Zencaster. But then again, they do not pay us to say anything good about them. But if you want to make your own podcast and you want to pay for the uh, tool, or if you don't want to pay for the tool, either way, you're going to get a quality product. It's worked out for us. It has saved my bacon many times. And it'll probably save your bacon too. Make your podcast so good. Audacity as well as what I use to edit this podcast. Also free. Also fantastic audio editing software. I can't say much more good stuff about it, but I could if they paid me to, but they don't. So give that a try, both of these. And personally, I would like to shout out a friend of mine from the college days, Ryan. Um, Ryan recently finished a screenplay and is actually looking to get it made. So Ryan, congratulations to you. Also, I think I found one of your IMDB reviews. R.S. Brandt. If that's not you, well, you're still getting a shout out anyways, but yeah, good luck, man. I'm really excited to see this movie when it comes out. And thanks for listening. Make sure you use actors or actresses we can link and put it on our podcast. Yes, but that's all I've got, team. Wow, this movie sucked. It yeah, it was pretty terrible, but I guess my... All, my list couldn't be hits all over the place. No, no. It, it's, it is nice to have a movie that kind of resets the palette and lets you know what a bad film really tastes like. Ah, uh, so where now are that we, we going finish next? Nithix, what are we watching next week? No, I, I want to keep correcting you, but this movie doesn't deserve the correction. Yeah, same here. Same here. Yes. Uh, I think next week we're going to run with Blades. Ooh, I like doing that. Pointing yeah. it up, right? Mm-hmm. Just like your yeah. kindergarten teacher taught you. Yep, and then constantly open and close them. Oh my god, I didn't make that connection. Rucker Howard's character in this was running around with a blade. And next episode, we're going to watch him in Blade Runner. Oh, wait, we're watching what? I thought we were watching Word Al Yankovich is uh, running with scissors. That's it for tonight's episode, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Fire Pit Podcast. Josh, you've got Hello, out. bots and listeners. My name's Josh. Uh-oh, I think Josh has been replaced by a replicant. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll give him the void comp test next week. We'll see how that goes. Well, anywho, I've been Josh. I've been Dan. And I've been Tom. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. Everyone looks at October like it's something to celebrate. None of these people have seen what I've seen. When they see a burst fire hydrant, they think... Hey, it's summer fun! I only think of my buddies being mowed down by Jerry on the beaches of Normandy. The blood, whoa, the entrails whoa, Tom, that Tom, just... Tom, bring it forward a little bit. You're ruining the joke. Uh, oh, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah. Anyway. I think we lost the guy there, Dan. Thanks. No, oh, it's not my... Wait. Tom, move your foot real quick. <laughs> I found something from that guy's wallet. This just looks like a receipt for some dry cleaning. One camo jacket... Bucket hat, three pairs of jeans? Who the hell dry cleans jeans? Clearly someone who cares about having jeans without wrinkles? Or clearly someone who doesn't know how clothes work. Take a look at the bottom of the receipt. Identify all the pictures with a sidewalk. None of the sidewalks are checked. Wait, it can't be... It's the only thing that makes sense. Dick's Dreamy Dry Cleaning, Los Angeles. Again? Not Los Angeles! Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. Nope, this one's from the original location. San Francisco. Oh, oh my God. thank God! Gentlemen, I think we may be on our way to finally cracking this case. Let's get back to the West Coast and nail this sucker to the wall. Oh, yeah. You can't smoke here! It's a subway! Dudes, you still can't smoke in here, bro. Yeah, and we're no closer to finding our terrorists. Sorry, detectives, but we have to insist that you stay and finish this case. A goose was cooked. And just when our case was heating up, but before they could smoke us out, our escape appeared right under my nose. Over there! The terrorists! Well, where, dude? Away!
<laughs> Catch you next time, sucker. Whoa, not cool, bro. For sure.